Welcome. Welcome to the 2020 Southwick Recital at Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Gregory Payne, the Chair for Communication Studies, the first Department of Communication in the United States in the School of Communication at Emerson. The Southwick Recital is a very special tradition at Emerson College, and we're very pleased to welcome you and to bring it back. The Southwick supports and furthers the oral tradition of presenting literature as part of the study and practice of communication, a focus for Emerson since its founding and a very proud part of it today. For the majority of you, this could be your first Southwick. This year's recital is going to be different in several ways. First of all, the majority of presenters are students. And obviously, this is being presented at Zoom. Now, for others of you, you've probably been here because you remember the Southwick as the event of the year when you were at Emerson. Some of you may have even been Southwick presenters yourselves. And we want you to know that whatever brings you here, your attendance is critical, and we're so happy to see you on Zoom. It's going to be a different Southwick this year than you've ever seen before, but Professor Ken Grout and his students have been working diligently to put together an event that simultaneously honors the tradition that we all love and propels it forward for a new generation to come. Let the Southwick begin, Ken. Thank you, Dr. Payne, much appreciated. Welcome everybody to the 2020 Southwick recital. I am Ken Grout. I am an instructor of oral presentation of literature in the communication studies department at Emerson. I am on the Emerson College campus in beautiful Boston, Mass, right across from the Boston Commons in the theater district. And we're so happy you're here. We are so happy you're here. And before we get the ball really rolling, I need to say a few thank yous, just a few, I promise. There are many people I could thank. And in fact, if you uh, haven't already done so, at some point, please, take a look at the program. It's at uh, emerson.edu backslash Southwick. Take a look at the program. And in the last page of the program, you're going to see a list of thank yous. And boy, oh boy, those are legitimate. I'll tell you what, we worked as a team on this in many different areas of the college. So please take a look at those. There are a handful of thank yous that I need to articulate here and now. Uh, first, let's start at the top. Emily Pelton, Emerson's president, uh, and everyone in your office, Ann Shaughnessy, thank you. President Pelton, um, this is a tough year for all of us, and it's a tough year at Emerson. And thanks to President Pelton's foresight and insight and some hindsight, uh, and his leadership, and quite frankly, his class, um, his, his dignity, have given us all the opportunity to be here. So let me, let me simply say, President Pelton, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your guidance. Uh, Dr. Raul Rice, the Dean of the School of Communication at Emerson College. Dean Rice has been instrumental in helping us get this uh, recital to you tonight. He's been critical in helping us shape it and think about it and getting it approved as part of the part of the college calendar of events, but also in reminding us that while we have the opportunity tonight to entertain, it's 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 a broader opportunity than that. It's about educating, it's about enlightening, and it's about elevating the material and the experience. So Dean Rice, thank you as always for your support. The gentleman who just introduced me, Dr. Greg Payne, uh, the chair of the communication studies department. You know, I mean, Greg, this was his idea. He came to me and asked me if I would shepherd this thing through. And when I didn't think I could, he, he encouraged me. And he basically made me believe that, that this was my project. And it is, but I'll tell you what, this was his baby and he handed it to me. And, and Greg, I thank you so, so much for taking a chance and, uh, and, and, and letting me craft this this year. So thank you, thank you for that. Jane Pierce Solnier is the associate chair 
of the Communication Studies Department. And Jane just probably cringed a little bit when she heard me mention her name because Jane's one of these people, she just is in the background simply doing her job. She's a heart, she just, she's the heart and soul and she, she moves the pieces, she connects the dots, but she also makes sure the dots are there when they're needed. So Jane, your guidance and uh, your patience and your mentorship to me at Emerson have meant the world and will continue to mean that to me. And I, I thank you. Thank you for your support on this recital. Okay. So the course, one of the courses I teach at Emerson is CC 264, which is oral presentation of literature. And this course, which I received uh, and shared with John Anderson and Agatha Morell, two colleagues and friends and mentors. Um, this course really involves the great oral tradition of presenting different kinds of literature. And we focus on uh, everything from personal narrative, short story, poetry, and plays. And it's a course, quite frankly, for everybody. And it's ultimately about understanding and communicating the messages of these pieces. So we keep that in mind in the context of tonight's presentation. So one of the things I thought of initially was for people who weren't familiar with the Southwick, and frankly, even for people who were, it would be great to have a short film that would help illustrate where the Southwicks came from, how they came to be, and how they evolved into what they are uh, right now. And so I decided to put together a film. I don't know anything about putting together a film. So I thought, who could help me? And one of the first names that came into my mind was a student of mine, not a former student, because once you're a student, you're always a student. So let's get that straight, everybody, right now. OK? All right. Anthony Lee. Emerson College visual media arts uh, graduate, 2017. Anthony went out to Los Angeles after graduation, uh, married the lovely Ariana. And when I thought about doing a short film, I said to Anthony, would you be willing to help me with this? And he said, yeah, what's the budget? And when I got done laughing, I said, Anthony, I, I just need you to see what you can do. Let's piece something together. He gave of his time, he gave of his talent, he gave of his resources ceaselessly and uh, simply in the best way, the best sort of Emersonian tradition, if you will, of putting art first. And so without further ado, we have a short film that is entitled The Southwick Recital, an Emerson tradition. And Anthony, I can't thank you enough I cannot thank you enough. And everybody here, you may not know it, but you're proud of Anthony Lee as an Emersonian and as a filmmaker. So let's let's take a look at the film and uh, let's go to the movies. What do you say? I'll see you in 10 minutes. In the fall of 1900, Henry Lawrence Southwick announced a series of interpretive recitals of Shakespearean comedy to be presented in Steinert Hall, 162 Boylston Street, Boston, on consecutive Friday evenings. The cost for a single subscription to the six recital series? Five dollars. And the series sold out. The Southwick series that began in the 1900s uh, became part of the popular offerings uh, for culture. And they became part of the cultural scene uh, alongside of the Lyceum, the lectures, uh, the Chautauqua circuit. And this prevailed uh, for much of the early part of the uh, 20th century. This notion of Southwick's, of oral interpretations of works written either for the stage, as with Shakespeare, or for the parlor, as with Alcott, was not a new one. The idea of presenting literature, both dramatic and otherwise, as an article of communication by a single interpreter, rather than as theater by a cast of actors, had been around for some time. 
There was a long-standing puritanical prejudice against theater. Actors and actresses were believed to be immoral, you know. <laughs> and platform performance provided a way around that anti-theatrical prejudice. Platform performances avoided sets and costumes and the morally suspect act of pretending to be someone you're not, of taking on a role. By staying within the more acceptable conventions of public speaking and lecturing. Platform performers, as these single interpreters came to be called, were an increasingly popular commodity in this country during the second half of the 19th century. Individuals presenting an entire play or an extensive rendering of prose or poetry offer an evening's entertainment and enlightenment. The best of the lot made a handsome living touring and presenting works from authors, playwrights and poets, both classic and modern. The most important author that was presented was Shakespeare. And one of the reasons was it was someone who spoke the language, who understood the language, spoke it clearly and made it meaningful and made it part of a, a person in the drama. As the acceptance and perceived legitimacy of such staged readings grew, certain authors took on the task of touring and presenting their own work themselves, partly as a marketing venture to increase sales of their written product, but also to ride the wave of popularity that platform performances were then enjoying. Of the well-known and successful two stood out, Charles Dickens and Mark Twain both toured extensively and both made significantly more money from their presentations during this time than they did from actual sales of their books. Dickens had considered an acting career as a young man and was an avid and acclaimed participant in amateur theatricals later in his life. So his effectiveness as a platform reader is perhaps no surprise. What was a surprise was how phenomenally popular his readings were, like that of a rock star in our time. It should come as no surprise that platform readings did well in Boston, and it makes sense, too, that a certain intimacy would form during those years between the art of interpreting literature and a burgeoning house of oratory study known as Emerson College. The literary recital started by Southwick in 1900 became a popular and lucrative attraction for the young institution. In the early days, Emerson was out there as a public venue, the, the Southwicks were, and thus they drew in the public, and there was a public to be drawn in. Southwick often headlined the proceedings. He had taught at Emerson and was subsequently dean before being installed as the third president of the college from 1908 until his death in 1932. Although these presentations were rechristened the Southwick recitals in his honor after his passing, many outside presenters appeared over the years, along with an array of Emerson faculty members, including Southwick's wife, Jessie Eldridge Southwick, herself a scholar and quality interpreter of Shakespeare. Leland Powers, who gained popularity for acting all the roles in plays on his own and was noted for being, quote, the first man on the platform in America to do this. Walter Bradley Tripp, who toured widely with his solo performance of David Copperfield. Edith Coburn Noyes, one of whose great triumphs was the old English comedy, She Stoops to Conquer. June Hamblin Mitchell, known to all on campus as Mama Mitchell, whose interpretations of Romeo and Juliet and the royal family were crowning achievements. Frances Crowley Lesotho, renowned for, among others, her singular interpretation of the play, Papa is All. Kenneth Cronell, regarded for his mastery of American musicals, My Fair Lady and The King and I. Dorothy Maines Prince, lauded for delivering and bringing to life the poetry of Maya Angelou and Phyllis Wheatley and John Dennis Anderson, known for working in the Chautauqua tradition and for his stellar interpretation of The Mutual Friend by Frederick Bush. Some of the most memorable uh, Southwick recitals for me were the ones by 
professors of oral interpretation at other colleges and universities as guest artists on the series. And in particular, I, I fondly remember Mary Frances Hopkins of Louisiana State University performing the story I Stand Here Ironing by Tilly Olson. I only saw it on videotape because it was made in the 60s, but I remember how delighted Mary Frances was when I told her how much I enjoyed watching the videotape of that performance. As time progressed, the types of selections began to broaden in scope, as did the shape of the Southwick event itself. An evening might focus on a single piece as it did with Pouring Tea, Black Gay Men of the South Tell Their Tales in 2008, and William Faulkner, A Literary Chautauqua in 2011. But an audience might also encounter several performers of an evening and may hear Frost, Whitman, and Browning, bookended with Sophocles, Virginia Woolf, Tennessee Williams, Neil Simon, or an original work by the artist. Helen Rose, a trustee of the college for over 50 years, someone who had saved the college from going bankrupt, decided after the death of Princess Diana, let's do a Southwick, but let's do a Southwick in Paris at the Ritz. So we took one of our most gifted performers, we took a couple of professors and alums, and we went and performed a Southwick at the Ritz in Paris. And what was intriguing to me was the performer did Isabella Stewart Gardner, who really epitomized the spirit of Diana in terms of fierce independence. And as I sat there reflecting that day in a beautiful autumn day in Paris, here is the Southwick, very global, in Paris at the Ritz. On October 26th, 1900, the first of what would come to be revered as the Southwick recitals delighted a capacity crowd who came to hear Leland Powers' interpretation of The Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare. In the near century and a quarter since, the Southwick has stretched and shifted and opened itself to new forms, new ideas, new writers, new presenters, all the while with an eye on a section of the credo that President Southwick himself crafted in 1930 for the college's 50th anniversary celebration. I believe in the study of great literature through interpretation, for service to others and for self-realization and understanding. Even as the soul of a mother's lullaby lies locked in the printed notes upon a page and is released when the mother love sings it, so the artist reveals life mysteries in terms of sound and sight. Interpretation is the pathway to realization. the Southwick recital and Emerson tradition and Anthony Lee, we're just, we're all very proud of you. And we're all very grateful that you gave of yourself so fully to uh, help generate that project. I just, I, I find the history of it fascinating, fascinating. And the more we learn about it, the more we want to learn about it. So I hope y'all enjoyed it as well. And I also need to thank in particular Lee Pelton, Emerson's president, for doing the voiceover for the words uh, of President Southwick. We wanted to sort of have the transition from President Southwick to President Pelton, and he willingly gave of his time to and his talents to um, take care of that for us. So many thanks. All right, on with the shoe, as they say, and what a shoe to begin with. Uh, it was 2001. And Broadway was about to be knocked on its quista by a little play known as The Producers. Mel Brooks and Thomas Meehan put, wrote the book based on Brooks' film of 30 plus years previously. And the play starred Nathan Lane, Matthew Broderick would go on to win 12 Tony Awards 
a record at the time and really uh, sort of almost changed the, the very chemistry of Broadway in the early part of this century. And we've got for you tonight a couple scenes from this play. There's a scene when the two characters meet and then there's a, uh, a scene, the second scene is at the courthouse. So without further ado, two scenes from The Producers, a play by Mel Brooks and Thomas Meehan uh, presented for you this evening by Communication Studies Junior, Jared Haynes. Jared? Who are you? What do you want? Why are you loitering in my hallway? Speak, dummy, speak. Why don't you speak? Scared. Can't talk. All right, get a hold of yourself. Take a deep breath. Let it out slowly and tell me who you are. I'm Leo Bloom. I'm an accountant. I'm from Whitehall and Marks. I was sent here to do your books and I'm terribly sorry I caught you with the old lady. <sighs> caught you with the old lady. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Tact. So, you're an accountant, eh? Yes, sir. Then account for yourself. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in gold? Why are you looking up old ladies' dresses? Bit of a pervert, eh? Sir, I... Never mind. Do the books. They're in the desk over there, top drawer. How dare you condemn me without knowing all the facts? But sir, I'm not- Shut up! I'm having a rhetorical conversation. Max Bialystok. Max Bialystok. You know who I used to be? Max Bialystok, King of Broadway. Six shows running at once. Lunch at Delmonico's, $200 suits. Look at me. Look at me now. I'm wearing a cardboard belt. I used to have thousands of investors begging and pleading to put their money into a Max Bialy stock production. Look at my investors now. Voila, bunch of little old ladies stopping off in my office for a last thrill on the way to the cemetery. You have exactly 10 seconds to turn that disgusting look of pity into one enormous respect. One, two, good, do the books. Eh. Window so filthy I can't tell if it's night or day out. <laughs> Would you look at that? A white Rolls Royce. That's it, baby. When you got it, flaunt it. I assume you're making those cartoonish noises to attract my attention. Am I correct in my assumption, you fish-faced enemy of the people? Oh, I've heard your feelings. Good, what is it? Sir, may I speak to you for a minute? You have 58 seconds, go. Well, in looking at your books, I discovered that 48 seconds left, you're using up your time. Oh, in looking at your books, I, I discovered that 28 seconds left, hurry up, tick tock, tick tock, tick. Mr. Bialystok, I cannot function under these conditions. <sighs> you're making me extremely nervous. <sighs> what is that, a handkerchief? Oh, oh, it's nothing really, it's nothing. Well, if it's nothing, why can't I see it? Ah! Ah! Give me my blanket! Give me my blue blanket! <laughs> Here, don't panic. I'm sorry. It's just a minor compulsion. I had it ever since I was a baby, and I can deal with it if I want to, but I find it very comforting. They come here. They all come here. How do they find me? <clears throat> Mr. Bialystok? Yes, Prince Mishkin. What can we do for you? This is hardly a time for levity, but I discovered a, a serious error in the accounts of your last play. I, I would like to say something, Your Honor. Not on my behalf, but in reference to my partner, Mr. Bialystok.
Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Max Bialystok is the most selfish man I have ever met in my life. Not only is he a, a liar and a crook and a scoundrel and a cheat who has taken money from little old ladies, he has talked people into doing things, especially me, into things that they would have never in a thousand years have dreamed of doing. But your honor, as I understand it, the law was created to protect people from being wronged. Your honor, whom has Max Bialystok wronged? I mean, whom has he really hurt? Not me, <laughs> not me. I mean, I was always Bloom. No one ever called me Leo before. They called me this man. I mean, I know it's not a big legal point, but even in kindergarten, they used to call me Bloom. <laughs> I never sang a song before. Well, with someone else. <laughs> I never sang a song with someone else before. But this man, this is a wonderful man. He made me what I am today. He did, really. It's so what of the dear ladies. What would their lives have been without Max Bialystok? Max Bialystok, who made them feel young and, and attractive and, and wanted again. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Jared. Woo! Thank you very much. Everyone here is applauding you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jared. It was great. Great, great. Personal narrative is one of the areas that we talk about in the uh, oral presentation of lit class. A personal narrative is where students are afforded the opportunity to write from their own past, write from their own realities, write from their own perspectives, and use their own voices to share those stories. And you hear stories, you know, you, as a professor, you listen to your students and you hear a lot of stories and there's some really wonderful ones, but every so often there's one that just makes you go, hmm, and this was one of those. So here with a piece of uh, written with her own hand entitled uh, Shirley Temple, this is senior theater and performance major, Juliet Walker. Juliet. Ah, oh, scoot over. Come on, you don't get the whole screen. That's not fair. She shimmies her body over a few inches, barely, but I don't want to argue anymore. I just want to get the show on the road. We lie on our tummies, feet flailing behind us, holding our heads up with our hands, pressing our elbows down into the shaggy carpet. There are pillows behind us that our mom put in our room to sit on while watching a movie. But why sit on a pillow when you can lie on the fur of a never before discovered animal? That must be what this carpet is made out of. We only adjust so we can raise our stubby little hands to press the power button on the bottom of the TV. It takes effort to push because it's huge and on its last legs. On comes the television. We close our eyes and bask in the LED glow from the screen. It's not that it's warm. Maybe it is warm. You can just feel it. The static radiates and makes our hair stand up. Our faces are barely an inch away from the screen. Mom says it'll make our brains melt, but that can't be true. No way. Anyway, it seems worth it if it is. We slide the tape in and wait. I'm picking at the plastic on the VHS cover and pulling Abigail's fiery red hair from the rings of the carpet until I hear the hum of the static before 20th century Fox Studio logo comes up and the music starts to fade on the screen. I stop fidgeting. This one's my favorite. I know, of course I know. No, but this one's my favorite. Shh, it's starting. I prop up Ellie the elephant with the American flag embroidered on her right thigh so she can have a good view of the screen too. Then I see her on the big screen, my idol, 
the most talented woman to exist? Shirley Temple. Has anyone ever been this good? Never, never, it's not possible. I'm sucked in. I don't think I even blink as I watch Elizabeth sing about animal crackers in her soup, making the other girls in the orphanage smile and dance along with her. I'm still surprised every time Mr. Morgan gets taken with her talent and offers to adopt her. Still cry when he falls for her older sister, Mary, and still feel all soft and good on the inside like my pink and purple swirly yogurt when the film ends with everything tied up in a nice bow. I look over at Abigail. I see her freckles illuminated by the screen and watch her sit up as the credits roll. She's not a fan of these movies. Not even Shirley Temple, I don't think. But always, always, always watches them with me. Want to watch another one? She says. It's okay, I lie. How about we play instead? She stares at me for a second and then laughs in my face. Yeah, right, she tells me and inserts another tape into the VCR. I love you, Abigail, I tell her. Quiet, she tells me. Miss Temple's about to sing. She plops on the floor next to me and we lay there in the half dark, my head leaning on her shoulder, singing along with Shirley Temple, simultaneously transported and grounded. Sisters. Thank you, Juliet. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you can see why it was it was uh, critical for me to have students included this year. Um, boy, such good stuff. All right. In the world of literature that we present in class that we work on, short stories are one of the one of the cornerstones of the work that we do. And presenting prose, presenting short prose is a challenge. Short stories have been around for a long, long time, but they really came into their own as popular vehicles in the mid to late part of the 19th century. And in the 20th century, uh, there were a number of uh, amazing short story authors. And the United States certainly held, held its own in terms of producing those authors. And the one we're gonna hear from now is not just of our American soil, but of a very local soil here. From Quincy, Mass, 10 miles down the road from Emerson, from where I'm standing right now, uh, John Cheever would go on to win the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize and go down as one of the great novelists and short story authors, uh, frankly, ever. And tonight we're so fortunate to have one of his stories presented by one of my students. So here with his interpretation of the story Reunion by John Cheever, this is senior visual media arts major, Joshua de Guzman. Josh. The last time I saw my father was in Grand Central Station. I was going from the Adirondacks and my grandmother's in the Adirondacks to a cottage on the Cape that my mother had rented. And I wrote to my father that I would be in New York in between trains for an hour and a half. And I asked if we could have lunch together. The secretary wrote back to say that he would meet me at the information booth at noon. And at 12 o'clock sharp, I saw him coming through the crowd. He was a stranger to me. My mother had divorced him three years ago and I hadn't been with him since. But as soon as I saw him, I felt he was my father, my flesh and blood, my future and my doom. I knew that when I was grown, I would be something like him. I'd have to plan my campaigns within his limitations. He was a big, good looking man and I was terribly happy to see him. He struck me on the back and shook my hand. Hi, Charlie, he said. Hi boy, I'd like to take you up to my club, but it's in the sixties. If you've got to catch an earlier train, I guess we'd better get something to eat around here. He put his arm around me 
And I smelt my father the way my mother would sniff a rose. It was a rich compound of whiskey, shoe polish, aftershave lotion, Wolins, and the rankiness of a mature male. I hope that somebody would have seen us together. I wish that we were photographed. I, I wanted some record of our having been together. We went out of the station and up a side street to a restaurant. It was still early and the place was empty. The bartender was quarreling with a delivery boy and there was one very old waiter in a red coat by the kitchen door. We sat down and my father hailed the waiter in a loud voice. Kauna, he shouted. Gasson, come on, you. His boisterousness in the empty restaurant seemed out of place. Could we have a little bit of service here? He shouted. Chop, chop. And then he clapped his hands. That caught the attention of the waiter and he shuffled on over. Were you clapping your hands at me? Calm down, calm down, sommelier, my, fa my father said. We would like a couple of beefy Gibsons. I don't like to be clapped at, the waiter said. Ah, I should have brought my whistle, my father said. I have a whistle that is audible only to the ears of very old waiters. Now take out your little pad and your little pencil and see if you can get this straight. Two B feeder Gibsons. Repeat after me. Two B feeder Gibsons. I think you'd better go somewhere else, the waiter said quietly. That, said my father, is one of the most brilliant suggestions that I have ever heard of. Come on, Charlie, let's get the hell out of here. I followed my father out of the restaurant into another. He was not so boisterous this time. Our drinks came, he cross-questioned me about the baseball season. He then struck the edge of his empty glass with his knife and began shouting again. Gasson Kilner, Cameron, on you. Could we trouble you to bring us two more of the same? How old is the boy? The waiter asked. That, my father said, is none of your goddamned business. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. The waiter said, but I won't serve the boy another drink. Well, I have some news for you, my father said. I have some very interesting news for you. This doesn't happen to be the only restaurant in New York. They've opened another around the corner. Come on, Charlie. He paid the bill and I followed him out of the restaurant into another. Here, the waiters wore pink jackets like hunting coats. And there was a lot of horse tacks on the wall. We sat down and my father began shouting again. Master of the hounds, tally ho and all sort of things. We'd like a little something in the way of a stork cup, namely Bip two Bips and Gee Feeders. Two Bips and Gee Feeders, the waiter asked. Mm, you know damned well what I want, my father said angrily. I want two beefy to Gibsons and make it snappy. Things have changed in jolly old England, so my friend the Duke tells me. Let's see what England can produce in the ways of a cocktail. This isn't England, the waiter said. Don't argue with me, my father said. Just do as you're told. I... I just thought you might like to know where you are, the waiter said. If there is one thing that I can't tolerate, my father said, it is an impudent domestic. Come on, Charlie. The fourth place we went to was Italian. Buon Giorno, my father said. Per favore, possiamo avere due cocktail americani. Forty, forty. Molto gin, poco mute. I don't understand Italian, the waiter said. Oh, come off of it, my father said. You understand Italian, and you know damned well that you do. Bogliamo due cocktail americani sabuto. 
the waiter left us and spoke with the captain who came over to our table and said, I'm sorry, sir, but this table is reserved. All right, my father said. Then get us another one. All the tables are reserved, the way the captain said. I get it, my father said. You, you don't desire our patronage. Is that it? Well, the hell with you. Not all inferno. Let's go, Charlie. I. I have to get my train, I said. I, I'm sorry, Sonny, my father said. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. He put his arm around me and pressed me into him. I'll walk you back to the club. I'll walk you back to the station. If, if there only had been time to take you up to my club, that's... It's all right, Daddy, I said. I'll get you a paper, he said. I'll get you a paper to read on the train. Then he went up to a newsstand and said, kind sir, will you be good enough to favor me while one of your goddamned no good 10 cent afternoon papers? The clerk turned away to stare at a magazine cover. Ah, is it asking too much for you to sell me one of your disgusting specimens of yellow journalism? I have to go, Daddy. I said it's late. Now just wait a second, Sonny, he said. Just wait a second. I want to get a rise out of this chat. Goodbye, Daddy, I said. And I went down the stairs and I got my train. And that was the last time I ever saw my father. Joshua de Guzman. Thank you, Josh. Great, great, great. Appreciate it. Okay, well, we've heard a couple scenes from a play and we've heard a uh, personal narrative. We've heard a short story. And now it's time for the fourth pillar that we focus on in uh, oral presentation of literature and that is poetry. And sort of following along with this relationships theme, all right, Jared talked about the relationship of these two uh, characters, Juliet with her character and her sister, Josh with the father and son. And now we're going to hear some poetry that talks about family relationships, predominantly parents and their children, with a little bit of a focus at times on the complicated relationships between mothers and daughters. So we have a bit of a poetry potpourri for you, three poems. This Be the Verse by Philip Larkin, My Mother by Ann Taylor, and The Last Time by an Unknown Poet. And these three poems are going to be presented for us this evening by senior theater and performance major, Faith Saparito. Faith? They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But of course they were fucked up in their turn by fools and old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It, it deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. Who fed me from her gentle breast and hushed me in her arms to rest and on my cheek, sweet kisses pressed? My mother, 
who sat and watched my infant head when sleeping in my cradle bed and tears of sweet affection shed? My mother, and can I ever cease to be affectionate and kind to thee, who was so very kind to me, my mother. When thou art feeble, old and gray, my healthy arm shall be thy stay, and I will soothe thy pains away, my mother. And when I see thee hang thy head, twill be my turn to watch thy bed, and tears of sweet affection shed, my mother. From the moment you hold your baby in your arms, you will never be the same. You will know tiredness. <laughs> like you never knew it before. Days will run into days that are exactly the same. <laughs> it might seem like a never ending cycle, but don't forget, there is a last time for everything. There will come a time where you feed your baby for the very last time. They will fall asleep on you after a long day and it will be the last time you ever hold your sleeping child. You will read a final bedtime story and wipe your last dirty face. They will run to you with arms raised for the very last time. The thing is, you won't even know it's the last time until there are no more times. And even then, it will take you a while to realize. So, while you are living in these times, remember that there are only so many of them. And when they are gone, you will yearn for just one more day of them for one last time. Thank you, Faith. Thank you so much. Such a nice job. Great, 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 great. Um, they're so good. All right. So again, short stories. William Faulkner is going to come up twice in tonight's presentation. And the first such occurrence of Mr. Faulkner's appearance is right now. William Faulkner, you could say in a lot of ways, was to the Deep South what John Cheever was to New England. Faulkner was born in Oxford, I believe, Mississippi, and he really gave rise to Southern Gothic form in novels, screenplays, and in many short stories and essays. And uh, one of Faulkner's great short stories is entitled A Rose for Emily. And here with a portion of the story, A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner is senior communication studies major, Bethelie Jean-Louis. Beth? When Miss Emily Grierson died, our whole town went to her funeral. The men threw a sort of respectful affection for a fallen monument. The women, mostly out of curiosity to see the inside of her house, which no one save an old manservant a combined gardener and cook had seen in at least 10 years. It was a big squarish frame house that had once been white, decorated with cupolas and spires and scroll balconies in the heavy lights and style of the Santis, set on what had once been our most select street. But garages and cotton gins had enroached and obliterated even the most august names of that neighborhood. Only Miss Emily's house is left lifting its stubborn and coquettish decay above the cotton wagons and gasoline pumps, ooh, an eyesore among eyesores. And now Miss Emily had gone to join the representatives of those august names, where they lay in the Cedar Bemuse Cemetery among the rank and anonymous graves 
of Union Confederate soldiers who fell at the Battle of Jefferson. Alive, Miss Emily had been a tradition, a duty, and a care, a sort of hereditary obligation upon the town, dated from the day in 1894 when colonial Taurus, the mayor, he who edict that no Negro woman should appear on the streets without an apron, remitted her taxes. The dispensation dated from the date of her father on into perpetuity. Not that Miss Emily would have accepted charity. Colonial Satoris invented an evolved tale to the fact that Miss Emily's father had loaned money to the town, which the town, as a matter of business, preferred this way of repaying. Only a man of Colonial Satoris' generation and thought could have invented it, and only a woman could have believed it. When the next generation with its more modern ideas became mayors and aldermen, this arrangement created some little dissatisfaction. On the first of the year, they mailed her a tax notice. February came, <laughs> there was no reply. They wrote her a formal letter asking her to call at the sheriff's office at her convenience. A week later, the mayor wrote her himself offering to call or to send his car for her and received a reply a note on a paper of an archaic shape in thin flowing calligraphy and faded ink to the effect that she no longer went out at all. The tax notice was also enclosed without comment. They called a special meeting of the Board of Eldermen. A deputation waited upon her, knocked at the door, which no visitor had passed since she seeds given China painting lessons eight or 10 years earlier. They were admitted by the old Negro into a dim hall from which a stairway mounted to a still shadow. It's not of dust and disuse, a close dank smell. The Negro led them into the parlor. It was furnished in heavy leather cup furniture. When the Negro opened the blinds of the one window, they could see that the leather was cracked. And when they sat down, a faint dust rose sluggishly about their thighs, spinning with slow moke in a single sun ray, on a tarnished gilt ease before the fireplace to the crayon portrait of Miss Emma's father. They rose when she entered. A small fat woman in black with a thin gold chain descending to her waist, vanishing to her belt, leaning on an ebony tarnished cane with a gold head. Her skeleton was small and spare. Perhaps that's why it would have been merely plumbness and another was obesity in her. She looked bloated, like a body, long submerged in motionless water, and that of a palicule. Her eyes were lost in fatty ridges of her face, looked like two small pieces of coal pressed into a lump of dough as they moved from one face to another while the visitors stated their errand. She did not ask them to sit. She just stood in the door and listened quietly till the spokesman came to a stumbling halt. Then they could hear the invisible watch taken at the end of her gold chain. Her voice was dry and cold. I have no taxes in Jefferson. Colonial Stores explained it to me. Perhaps one of you can gain access to the city records. Satisfy yourselves. But we have. We are the city authorities, Miss Emily. Did you get a notice from the sheriff signed by him? I received the paper. Yes, Miss Emily said. Perhaps he considers himself the sheriff. I have no taxes in Jefferson. But it's nothing to show that on the books. You see, we must go by the... See? Colonial stories. I have no taxes in Jefferson. But Miss Emily... See? Colonial stories. Colonial stories had been dead almost 10 years. I have no taxes in Jefferson. Tell me. The Negro appeared. Show these gentlemen... Thank you, Bethelli. Amazing. Thank you so, so, so much. Oh God, you guys were all great. Now, if, you're, if your inclination is to say, hey, something's wrong with Zoom. Ken looks more interesting and he seems to be seated. It's not a technological issue. I am more interesting and I am seated. So when Dr. Payne asked me to take on the Southwick recital, he explained to me that the tradition of the Southwick was for faculty 
or uh, honored guests, special guests to present. And I said to him, I really wanted the students this year. And he said, this is actually how the conversation went. I said, this is what I'd like to do. And he said, absolutely, whatever you'd like. I think it's a wonderful idea. I support you fully. You'll be presenting too. I have a meeting. And then he left. So I'm presenting too. <sighs> so this is a play with two characters. It's a play about a woman named Betty and a man named Bill, both in their late 20s. The play takes place uh, in a cafe. Betty is seated and she's reading a book on and off and Bill approaches. But there's one more thing you need to know about this play. There's a third character, sort of, that is a bell. And the bell sounds like that. Uh, the bell is a bell that helps the play sort of change course, change directions. Uh, there's an old improv game where you say something and then someone hits the bell and you have to say it a different way and they hit the bell and you keep saying it different ways until the bell doesn't ring anymore. This play takes a page out of that canon, but this is a very crafty, very intricate piece of work that was written by the Chicago playwright, uh, David Ives, and it was first produced in 1988, so it's much more of a modern work. He published it in uh, 1994. So the play is entitled Sure Thing by David Ives. Excuse me, is this chair taken? Excuse me, is this chair taken? Yes. Oh, sorry. Sure thing. Excuse me, is this chair taken? Excuse me, is this chair taken? No, but I'm expecting someone in a minute. Oh, well, thanks anyway. Sure thing. Excuse me, is this chair taken? Excuse me, is this chair taken? No, but I'm expecting someone shortly. Oh, well, would it be all right if I sit here until he or she or they or it comes? Well, they do seem to be running late. You never know who you might be turning down. <laughs> Sorry. Nice try, though. <laughs> sure thing. Excuse me, is this seat taken? No, it's not. Would it be all right if I sit here? No, it wouldn't. Oh. Excuse me, is this seat taken? No, it's not. Would it be all right if I sit here? Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Every place else was taken. Mm hmm. It's a great spot. Mm hmm. What's the book? I'd really like to read in quiet, if you don't mind. Sure thing. Every place else was taken. Mm -hmm. It's a great spot though for reading. Yes, I like it. What's that book? The Sound and the Fury. Oh, Hemingway. What's the book? The Sound and the Fury? Oh, Faulkner. Have you read it? Mm, no, but I've certainly read about it. I've heard it's supposed to be great. <laughs> it is great. I hear it's supposed to be great. Waiter. What's the book? The Sound and the Fury? Oh, Faulkner. Have you read it? Nah, I'm a Mets fan myself. <laughs> Have you read it? Mm, I read it in college, yeah. Well, where was college? I went to Oral Roberts University. Where was college? 
I didn't go to college. I was lying. I just liked to party. Where was college? Harvard. Do you like Faulkner? I love Faulkner. I spent a whole winter reading him once. Oh, uh, well, I've just started. I was so excited after 10 pages that I had to go out and buy every single thing he ever wrote. It was one of the most amazing reading experiences of my life. I mean, all that psychological understanding and the page after page of gorgeous prose is profound grasp of the mysteries of time and human existence. The smells of the earth. What do you think? <laughs> well, I think it's pretty boring. What's the book? The Sound and the Fury? Oh, Faulkner. Do you like Faulkner? I love Faulkner. <laughs> He's incredible. I spent a whole winter reading him once. I was so excited after the first 10 pages that I had to go out and buy everything else that he wrote. It's all that incredible psychological understanding and his prose is gorgeous. And the way that he grasps the mysteries of time and human existence, I know. I just, I don't know what took me so long to start reading him, you know? Well. I mean, you never know. You might not have liked him if you had started before. That's true. I mean, you have to be ready for these things, you know? You have to hit these things at the right moment. Otherwise, it's no good. That very thing has happened to me. It's all in the timing, you know? My name's Bill, by the way. I'm Betty. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, reading Faulkner was a great experience. <laughs> yes. The sound and the fury. <laughs> well, onwards and upwards. <laughs> Waiter. Waiter. You have to hit these things at the right moment, you know, otherwise it's no good. That's, that very thing has happened to me. It's all in the timing I find. My name's Bill, by the way. I'm Betty. Hi. Hi. So do you come in here a lot? Every so often, how about you? Not much anymore, really. Not like I used to before my nervous breakdown. Do you come in here a lot? Why do you ask me that? Uh, um, I'm interested. Are you really interested? Or are you just trying to pick me up? <laughs> no, I'm really interested. But I just, because, hey, the thing, why are you really interested about whether I come in here a lot? I'm just trying to get acquainted. Mm. Or maybe, maybe you're just trying to make small talk long enough to get me to come back to your place to listen to some music or because you've got some great new tape for your VCR or some terrific unknown Django Reinhardt record. But all you really want to do is fuck, which you won't do well. And when you're finished, you'll go into the bathroom, pee very loudly, and then you'll pad into the kitchen, open the refrigerator, get yourself a beer. You won't bother asking me whether I'd like anything. And then you'll come back to the bedroom, lie down next to me and proceed to confess how you've actually got a girlfriend named Stephanie who's studying in medical school in Belgium for a year and the two of you have been involved with each other on and off in what can only be described as an intricate relationship for the past seven years.
none of which interests me, mister. Okay. Do you come in here a lot? Every other day, I think. Because I come in here quite a lot and I don't recall ever seeing you. Well, I guess we're not on the same schedule. Missed connections, huh? <laughs> Different time zones, more like it. It's amazing how you can live right next door to somebody your, your whole life and, and not even know it. Mm, city life. It's crazy. We probably pass each other in the street every day. I mean, right in front of this place even, probably. Uh-huh. Yeah. All I know is the waiters in this place sure do seem to be in different time zones. I cannot locate. Oh, waiter. Uh, so what do you. I beg pardon. Nothing. Sorry. I guess we must be on different schedules. Missed connections. Different time zones. Say, you weren't waiting for someone when I first came in, were you? Actually, I was. Boyfriend? Sort of. What's a sort of boyfriend? My husband. Say, you weren't waiting for someone when I first came in, were you? Actually, I was. Boyfriend? Sort of. <laughs> What's a sort of boyfriend? Well, we were meeting here to break up. What's a sort of boyfriend? My lover. Oh, there she comes now. Say, you weren't waiting for someone when I first came in, were you? No, no, I was just reading. It's kind of a sad occupation, isn't it? For a Friday night, I mean, you sitting here all by yourself reading. Do you think so? I mean, what's a good looking woman like you doing out all alone on a Friday night? <laughs> Trying to stay all the way away from lines like that. Say, you weren't waiting for someone when I first came in, were you? No, no, I was just reading. It's sort of a sad occupation, isn't it? For a Friday night, I mean, you sitting here all by yourself reading? I guess it is. I mean, what's a good looking woman like you doing out all alone? on a Friday night. I'm, I'm out all alone on a Friday night for the first time in a very long time. Oh. I, I just ended a relationship recently. Oh, I see. Of a very long standing I'm sorry, but since you and I both agree that it's kind of a sad occupation, you know, you sitting here by yourself reading, would you like to go somewhere else? No. Do something else? No. No, thank you. I was thinking after this, maybe going to the movies, would you care to? I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe give old Faulkner a break there, right? He's gotta be getting tired, all those long sentences. Thanks anyway. Okay. Is it, I, 
I appreciate, I appreciate the invitation. Sure thing. See, you weren't waiting for someone when I first came in, were you? No, 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 I was just reading. It's kind of a sad occupation, isn't it? For a Friday night, you sitting here all by yourself reading? <laughs> I don't know, I thought of it as um, sort of existentially romantic, you know, cappuccino, rainy night, great literature. Nah, come on, that only works in France. It's not too late. We could catch the late plane to Paris. What do you say? Grab the Concord, find a cafe. Mm. I'm a little short on plane fare tonight to France. <laughs> Damn it. Me too. Listen, I was thinking of maybe going to the movies after I finished this section. Would you like to come along? I mean, since you can't locate a waiter. <laughs> oh, uh, it's a nice, nice suggestion. Thank you, but. Girlfriend, two. One's pregnant and then there's Stephanie. Girlfriend, mm, sort of, sort of. <laughs> What's a sort of girlfriend? My mother. I just ended a relationship myself recently. Oh. Of rather long standing. I'm sorry to hear it. This uh, tonight, uh, it's actually my first night out alone in uh, some time. And uh, I'm a little at sea, if you want the truth. Oh, so when you stopped to talk, that's all it was? I mean, you're not like a Mooney? You don't have some like weird political affiliation or something? No, straight down the ticket Republican, straight down the ticket Democrat. I'm a citizen of the universe. Can I talk to you about politics? I'm unaffiliated. Oh, thank heavens, so am I. I vote my beliefs. I do too. I think labels are so, labels are not important. Labels are not important. You are absolutely right. I mean, so what if I got a two point at, a three point at, a four point at college, or that I come from Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Westchester County? Sure. I mean, a man is, a man should be who a man is. I mean, a person should be who he is. A person should be who they are. I think so too. So what if I admire Trotsky? So what if I had full body liposuction? So what if I have no penis? So what if I spent a year in the Peace Corps? I was affixed to my convictions. I understand and support you completely. You can't just hang a label on people. I know absolutely what you, you're a Scorpio, aren't you? Listen, I really was going to the movies after I finished this section. Would you like to come along? Uh, sounds like fun, actually. What's playing? A couple of the really early Woody Allen films. You like the really early ones? I think anyone who doesn't ought to be run off the planet. Well. How many times have you seen bananas, for example? Eight. Twelve. <laughs> you still interested? Do you like Enten Mint's crumb cake? Last night, I had to go out at two in the morning just to get one. Did you have an Etch-a-Sketch as a child? I did. Do you like Brussels sprouts? No, I think they're disgusting. They are disgusting. And do you still believe in marriage despite current sentiments against it? Yes. And children, three, two girls and a boy, Harvard, Vassar, and Brown. And will you love me? Yes. And cherish me forever?
You still want to go to the movies? <laughs> sure thing. Waiter. First of all, I have to say for anybody in the audience, thank you so much, Ken. That was just an incredible performance. And as also, all, I think we all in the audience, when you think of Bethley, what you brought back in terms of your performance, Faith, Joshua, Juliet, all I can say is having seen many Southwicks and I know Dr. Silvestri, as well as Jane and John Anderson and Susie Sims Fletcher, so many people who've been sending me emails as well as chats. So excited to see what you've done, Ken, to bring this great tradition back. Because we can see this was the oldest continuing recital series in the entire country. It's been revitalized by your energy and the excitement of students tonight. What I would like to say in closing also for all of you students, as well as alums and others out there, I think what you can see is the power of literature. And to remember that literature is theater and literature is communication. And we were the first communication college and department in the entire country. Please come and take Ken Grout's classes, be a part of this proud tradition. And I know when I saw tonight's performances and before we close, I do wanna thank Satch and I wanna thank Diego and all the people who worked so hard to put this Zoom together. But more importantly, to our performers and Professor Grout, because without his energy, it would never have happened. I know when I looked at that video, you could almost feel President South would come alive. And I know in speaking with Lee Pelton, he was so excited that we have brought this tradition back to Emerson. Now, some of you probably said, I would like to see more of these. And the beauty of it is you can, because right now we have our own webpage. All you need to do is go to the college's webpage and you can check out the YouTube channel where you can see not only this, but past Southwicks of the, of the past. And what I would like to say is, once again, there is a bright light for the Southwick recital, the College on the Common, Emerson College in the heart of the theater district. Good night, and we look to see you either in person or in Zoom. May the Southwick continue. Good night.